unfiltered um, pieces on issues that's going on in the city that directly affects them. Um, along with that paper, we also, like you mentioned, started the initiative Reset Louisville, which we laid out a five point plan um, that addresses healthcare, financial education, home ownership, fresh food supply, and healthcare. Um, and each one of those five disparities we formed into committees and we're starting to get programs, innovative programs up and running for each one of those programs. And like you mentioned, our housing program was the first one we've been able to get up and running, which we should be able to, we will be breaking ground in our first three homes in the next couple of weeks before the year is over. Um, as far as, a gener as the generation, I'm your typical millennial, I, the son, my mother was in college when she had me, she had me young, 17, 18 years old. I lived on a college campus with her for a while, moved around, um, you know, non-complacent, whatever everybody calls us millennials. You know, that's me. That's why I chose the entrepreneur route and I'm just eager to get in this conversation. Okay, well, somehow, why don't you take it from there? Tell us a little bit about where you came from, how you got here and what are you doing now? Yeah, so my parents are originally from Ethiopia. They were refugees who came over in the 80s. So I was born in Seattle, Washington. Um, I just joined the Louisville community right before high school. Um, so I'm a little bit more of a recent addition, but my parents have always been very, you know, very prominent voices in my life, educating me about the news, especially what's going on back in Ethiopia, which started my interest in community issues at a very young age, because I felt like as a kid, I was always exposed to what was going on in Ethiopia and how that compared to what's happening here in America. And those parallels really shaped me going into political science. So that's really where my passion is. Um, and I've really been focusing on human rights issues, as you said, um, but I'm also really passionate about education. That's something that I've been, I've been working as a tutor and facilitating, facilitating sorry, conversations. Um, back on Duke's campus, when I was a student, I did a lot of work where I was a person who facilitated meetings to talk to others about their impact of tutoring in Durham, North Carolina, which is a predominantly black public school system. And a lot of the students at Duke were upper middle class white people. So um, a lot of my work on Duke's campus has really been bridging the gap between the city of Durham and being on Duke's campus. So that's just a little bit more of what I've done here on stateside, but yeah. Outstanding, and, and DeLorean? Yeah, so, you know, my name is DeLorean Malone. I got an MBA from the University of Louisville, just like, you know, uh, Senator Neal went through. Um, you know, one of my things that, one of my focuses, you know, I'm a financial professional, and one of my focuses is bringing, you know, some of the financial uh, things that, you know, our, our community kind of misses out on back to the community. You know, there's a lot of individuals that, that work in the financial industry, but they don't typically deal in our community. So one of my things is I, I typically try to go into our community and make sure I educate individuals on, you know, the importance of, you know, getting their finances together, the importance of budgeting and other things that, you know, we kind of fall behind and don't really get the information on. Um, I'm a Morehouse man, uh, graduated from there in uh, 2014, bachelor's of biology pre-med. And then I uh, also done a little bit of work, um, you know, with uh, elections before. Uh, I've worked on uh, Lisa Langford's campaign. Uh, she was a, a circuit court judge and we, we helped beat an incumbent out. And uh, one of the things I thought that was so important was because we talk about representation and representation matters and it matters as well, you know, in the courtroom. So that's why I chose to, to work on that campaign. But in regards to, you know, being a millennial, I'm your, your average millennial. I'm the guy who they say, oh, well, he doesn't, you know, these millennials don't invest in anything. They don't want to do anything. And, you know, I've had multiple different jobs and different careers that have led me to where I'm at now. And it's, and it's, it's, it's a, I would say it has a little bit to do with me being uh, a millennial and feeling like in certain workplaces, I'm not giving my value. So uh, well, we can get into a little bit of that, but. Yeah. Well, let, 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 let me say this, just listening to each of you, uh, sounds like you guys are focused. 
that you are headed somewhere, that you are making your way there. I, I believe the age grouping between uh, Adia and Samha is what, 22? Am I correct on that? You're just coming out of college, basically, recently, and you're making yeah, these we next graduated steps. May of this year. I'm sorry? We both just graduated May of this year. There, okay. So you, you just taking off, but you're still engaged. And yeah. then you have, we have DeLorean and Anthony, and I believe you all's age is what, 28? 28. 28. So we got a, we have a wide range between in this discussion about millennials. And so what I want to ask you is this, I mean, you look like you involve people. What about your counterparts? What about the people you know? What is your observation about those in your age group? Who wants to take that first? I'll start it off. Um, my observation, you know, I'm sure Delorean might have the same thing. He mentioned a couple of things. You know, a lot of people our age at that part, at that point of our past jobs and career moves have put us in the position where we are today. You know, we're at that point of where we've been trying to figure out what it is, what is our purpose here, what is our uh, career of choice, what is that career that we're going to be able to do that we enjoy doing. Um, and I think at 28, you know, some of us may have been able to just now get that idea of what that is and others are still taking a little time. And I'm one of those people that believe, you know, life's a journey. So whether you're a millennial or not, as far as how far along you are in your, you know, career or anything, you know, it's just part of what your journey is. But the people I know and talk to were about that, that part where you had a couple jobs, walked away from a few jobs and career opportunities to try to figure out what it is that you uh, have a passion for. So, so Adia, what do, you, what do you say about that? I mean, what you're 22, you're just coming out. Uh, you've had the college experience recently and you're looking around, you, you're taking the next steps. What do you see in your counterparts? Not you, your counterparts. What are they doing? Are they doing the same thing you're doing, basically? Um, I think that very much depends on which counterparts, because you have to think, um, for my friends I went to college with, um, so like my college educated counterparts are very much work driven. I think a lot of us right now are focused on trying to be the biggest and the best, and we're very goal oriented. Um, a lot of us are trying to seek titles, but at the same time, we don't like the idea of settling down in the place for a long time. So like no one wants to work at a company for 10 or 20 years and work their way up. We want, you know, to have a career path that's going to get us somewhere fast. It's going to get us where we want to be. That's going to make impact immediately. And then for those friends of mine who maybe not be uh, college educated, it's a little bit different. A lot of people are work oriented. And again, I think a lot of us tend to be focused on immediate impact and goal are very goal driven and we want to see satisfaction quickly. And we want to be satisfied by the things that we do. So I think for my generation, a lot of us are just striving and seeking and trying to make sure that we make the right choices now because we realize the impact is going to have later. So, so somehow, let me, let me ask you a question. You, do you, have you maintained our uh, relationships with uh, those around your age or even older in the millennials uh, outside of the United States as well as in the United States? I have, yeah. Um, one of my final projects, um, my capstone basically um, for Duke that I just completed in May was a project about the Yaakul movement in Eritrea. And Yaakul just translates to enough. Um, if you're not super familiar with what's going on in Eritrea, basically ever since they got independence in the 90s, they've been led by the same quote unquote president for like the past 27 years-ish. Um, so effectively a dictator. And so I focused a lot about the protest culture that uh, people are talking about back in Eritrea. So I did a lot of research and got to talk to a lot of people on the ground, which was really interesting um, because obviously communication is very limited. Um, the press is, can be turned off at any time and internet connections is turned off on a whim. So I did have the unique opportunity to see what other people are doing. And it was very, I guess invigorating to see that they also have that same sort of drive that we do here. Um, the only thing is obviously I feel like they lack the resources. It's very different. Um, this past summer, we had the opportunity to take to the streets, obviously after Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and all the other things that we saw happen this summer. However, they have to protest and organize in a very different manner, which is something that I found very interesting. Um, 
a lot of their organizing is digitally, but it also has to be very covert due to the nature of the regime that currently leads there. But all that to say, I think, yeah, I think they have a very, very similar drive to we do, but um, obviously the methodology of what they're doing is very different because they just don't have the same resources we do. Okay, interesting. Well, well DeLorean, you know, you are you in, you're in the professional realm, you're looking around you, not everybody's doing the same thing you're doing. Uh, so what are your counterparts doing? Do you see them as moving around or thinking generally the same way you do or what's the difference, if any? Yeah, so, you know, I do, you know, I, I do have a career working a, you know, certain profession, but, you know, I have friends that are in every, every, you know, different type of industry. And one of the things that I've noticed, you know, and just directly dealing with, and, and this is, you know, depending on whether black or white or whatever, uh, millennials, we, we're in a position where we just want to eat, you know, we're in a position where we have been in the workforce now, we've gotten some time in the workforce, and now we've seen that we are barely getting returns on the work. Initially, when we graduated, they wanted us to have, to, to live off of experience, right? Well, you know, food doesn't cost experience, food costs money. And so one of the things that we are running into is where we're going and we're putting in the work at these jobs and we're not being paid what we feel we need to be paid. And one of the things that um, I feel is, 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 is a reason why is because, you know, we do have a certain type of, you know, not necessarily a divide, but there's different ways of which an older generation will think about things. And we need the older generation to pass down the torch and teach us and bring us up. So that is, that's one of the things that I've noticed that, you know, a lot of my friends and counterparts are experiencing is that we, we're not given, you know, the pay for what we bring to the table. Wow. So, I'm interested in that last statement you just made. You're looking, and correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, you're looking for the older generation to do to bring you up or to show you a pathway, or what are you what are you saying? Yes, I, I think that that is typically would be the normal progression of things, right? Because if you were, say, it was a sole proprietor business, right, and you were the only individual who you know was the know-how and you want this business to survive after you're gone. Well, if you are the only one keeping the secrets and you're not training anybody to replace you, when you leave, the business is going to struggle. Doesn't mean the business is gonna fail completely, but it's going to struggle. And so the normal progression, of, we're not on this planet forever. So we need to take you know, the, the tools and the experiences and shared experiences from the older generation and pass it down to the millennials. So let me ask you a question then, uh, and I'm gonna spread this out a little bit. So is this is this in a specific area, or do you see this as generally an issue? The a lack of communication, maybe mentoring, uh, relationships between the older generation and younger generation. What? I think it's it's got a little bit. Yeah, I think the mentorship structure is a little bit off with us. You know, we we have a kind of aversion maybe towards reaching out to, you know, older folk to get that type of mentorship. And they don't, I mean, I don't have, I don't know about everybody else on this, you know, but I don't really get a lot of older folk just reaching out to me and saying, hey, DeLorean, you know, I want to mentor you. So I think that we got to start having these type of conversations. Okay, uh, come on, guys, jump in. Do you agree with what he says? Is your experience similar? Uh, how do you see it? I think, um, interestingly enough, I would say I view it in almost an opposite way. I would say that, and this could be like again a different thing with us being four years apart, a generational thing. But I think oftentimes for the people my age, it's not even that we don't feel like that we have the mentorship, but I think we are like diffusing and kind of moving away from the ways that older generations have have worked in the past. So it's not even that we want, you know, tools to be passed down. We want this knowledge and information. We're more so disputing the information you guys are offering us. Um, because we've seen, historically speaking, we've seen how you guys or other older generations have worked at companies for 40 years. We've seen how you brand things. We've seen how it's worked. 
and that's not how we want to do it, you know, and that's not what we want to see for ourselves. So it's not even about, I guess, not having the mentorship and the tools, but it's rather us trying to create our own toolbox and us saying, you know what, we don't want this, like, we don't want to learn the way you guys do it. We don't want to do it that way because that way doesn't seem like it doesn't, you know, that's not our vision and that's not what we want for ourselves. And so I think our generation or specifically like with our age group, it's a lot of refuting old ways and trying to come up with new ones. So, so, so correct me if I'm wrong. So, and, and I know, I know I, I don't want to box DeLorean in because I know he has a broad piece to expand, uh, to uh, expound upon other than what he just said. But I, 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 I'm seeing where DeLorean and you, either one of you can correct me is saying, Hey, look, I, I want to get in the game, but uh, I want you to engage me in this game that I'm getting into. Uh, so that I can be the best that I can be, et cetera. And I, but I hear you saying, correct me if I'm incorrect about this, is that, uh, okay, we've looked at your game and, uh, you know, we're, we're bright and we got energy and we, we're going to do this thing our way because we don't like the model that you put out there. Uh, we're moving fast. This is a different era. And uh, does that mean you dismiss uh, the older generation in that regard? Oh. I wouldn't necessarily call it a dismissal. I'd say an observation of ways and like taking what we can. So taking what will benefit us the best and recreating something new for ourselves. So I don't think it's a complete dismissal of the things of the way it used to function, but I think that it's more of a taking what we need and being having the confidence to say, you know what, I've gained these three school, um, skills and tools from you, but I don't think I want the whole toolbox. I think these are some good ideas. I'm gonna make them, I'm gonna implement them in my own way. And I'm gonna create a new strategy for this game and I'm gonna see how it works for me. Um, and I think that that may be for some like where they see this generational divide or this gap is because I think a lot of people, a lot of this, these younger generations, we, like I said, we want kind of quick results and we wanna see, we wanna see little reap benefits rather faster than what's been done historically speaking. And so in order to do that, you have to play the game a little bit differently. So Anthony, what, I think, how do you see it? No, I think that's so interesting listening to what everyone has to say, because uh, I know myself, I'm a debater by nature. So I've had this conversation with my parents, you know, for years. And when I was 21, 22 years old, you know, I thought that I was saying the same thing. Like we've seen y'all do everything. So it's time, it's our time. I'm going to do things my way. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've gotten a lot of trouble for the exact very reason growing up, um, just because I always felt like we, this generation, we're smarter. We've seen what you all have done. And, um, you know, I can move on and do that. But I also, at this point in my life, I agree more so with DeLorean. Um, and it's a mix between both of them because it's true that, you know, you take what you can from them. You know, I've, I work with older generations <clears throat> and you listen to them, you take what you can, but you also put your ideas and everything behind it. But also I've learned that just by being around someone who's a baby boomer, who's 60 something years old, that's been in the same career field as you, it's like a um, shortcut. You know, honestly, for me, since I've had that change of heart and understand, you know, the value of meshing with different generations, it's been a complete shortcut as far as where I was when I first moved out here and to where I am today. And before I moved out here, I was in several other business ventures, um, opportunities that I wanted to pursue. And, you know, they picked up traction and then, you know, failed, learned that lesson, pick up traction, failed, learned that lesson. And then when I got to this point, it's like I'm not having to fail at so many opportunities to learn certain lessons. I'm able to get that um, from my mentors, my OGs, my parents. Um, now that I'm old enough to understand, like, yeah, maybe I should listen to <laughs> what they got to say, because it really is like a, a shortcut, speeding up your process. Well, I got I got to throw this to some hall. Some hall's got to clear this up for us. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I think. Um... I just wanted to qualify, I guess, what Anthony was saying. I think I'm obviously not going to speak for Adia or anything, but I I think I really want to emphasize what she said about like making our own toolbox, but still bar borrowing like tools from boomers and older generations, because I think at the end of the day, how I would describe it is like a growth mindset. And the way like in education, the way that I've understood a growth mindset is just like nothing's perfect and you're just going to grow from that. Um, obviously we've seen the merits of what previous generations have done, but a lot of people nowadays are just not, you know, complacent with that. And I think like, obviously it makes sense that we want quicker results because 
as we're learning more about our history and like as we learn more about you know the social issues like we've seen that these things have happened for way too long and even though we are only like 22 like I feel like I'm already tired of it you know like I feel like at the end of the day I'm just like this is all I have to look forward to and I want to take action in some way to grow from that and not to not a complete dismissal as you said before I definitely think that there's something that we can learn but I also think if we're going to accelerate at the at the pace that I'm seeing that my counterparts are interested in then we we have to abandon the idea of just borrowing everything from the people before us. We have to make it our own in some way or another. I, I think also too, our generation is the generation that grew up on technology. So we are the generation of tech and we are used to having information at our fingertips and that's the knowledge. So when you tell us that things happen slowly, we like we don't accept that anymore because we've seen it happen for ourselves. We've seen technology events, we've seen things happen quickly. So for us, I think timing like the time frame or the mindset of time and the construct of time looks differently for our generation than it does for older generations we conceptualize time in a different way because mm -hmm. if i can find out everything that's happening in ethiopia right now within a 30 second google why should i have to wait 20 years to see a revolution like i like we don't conceptualize that because we've seen things advance we've seen things happen quickly because of technology and so now our expectations are for things to happen a lot quicker and I think yeah, it's interesting think, too because it's our first time doing stuff and stuff that's not supposed to be so quick, we expect it to be quick. I think that's really interesting because when, as soon as you spoke of it, I, I was like, you know what? It's hilarious because I'm now, I'm now, now I'm getting to see myself, you know, some years ago and I'm like, is this what they were looking at? I, okay, well, maybe I could get with them and see why maybe they didn't want to, you know, yeah. they had that pushback against us because yes, we 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 saw the same thing anthony to tell you we saw we saw their generation before us do things and we saw that doesn't make sense why are you doing that that's really you know we we could do it better how about you let us go ahead and do whatever but you know now afterwards i'm it's we can't just what i'm starting to realize is that you can't just beat the door down right you know we we got to you know grab hands and walk through the door because like if I'm the if there's three doors right in front of you and I, and I you got to go and figure out which door is the safe door and then there's one door and I already been through and I know that door's got fire on it. If I tell you that door's got fire, you're not going to go through that door. So you have now saved yourself some time and you can go through the correct door because of the shared experiences from the generation above you. So that's that's just what I've grown to to my mindset has grown over the time. I I, I got to go back to Adil just for a second. Adil, you got to respond to that. <laughs> Come on, um, give us some insight on that. That's very much so a hard one. And I think DeLorean's point, I think what he is trying to argue is that it's be which it could very much be true. The fact that I'm 22 and you're 28, right? It's the fact that we have this six year difference. So maybe in six years' time, I'll see it differently. But I really think that it's Gen Z. But I really think that our mindset isn't about like knocking on doors, it's about kicking down doors. Like, I, I don't want to go and knock door by door. We're coming through with the with the, the bullhorn or whatever it is, and we're daring down each and every door um, and finding out. And so I think, again, this could very much change in six years. It could be that like right now I have this expansive mindset and all these ideas and I'm eager and I think that the world will work like this. It could be that I see that brick wall later and I'm like, you know what, this isn't going to work. I have to reevaluate. Um, but I think that's the joy in all of it. You know, we get to see these generations develop and we get to see how things change over time in the same way that I'm sure Senator Neal, you look at us and you're like, whoa, those young kids. And I'm sure the way that like even DeLorean and Anthony look at us and they're like, whoa, they're going to learn, give it a couple years, you know? Maybe you at know, one point we'll get there and we'll be like, whoa. Now, you know, I got to jump in there on that one. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I was waiting on that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, when I look at you, I'm going to tell you what I see. You know what I see? You know what I see me. <laughs> when I look at you all, I, 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 I'll tell you, I see it over and over again. When I see you all, and as I hear you expressing yourself now, I remember the, the youthful, the, the energy, the exuberance, and, you know, wanting to move forward. And I think that's in, I think you've got to have that. You know, you can't move without that fire, you know, and I, I admire that, and I can feel it. Um, but then I, I hear uh, experiences taught me a few things, which it will teach all of us as we go through life, of course, right? An experience like not going through that door that, you know, you know, as a downer or as Anthony was talking about, you know, hey, <laughs> I, he used the word failed, 
but he understood that that was a learning process and he's built from that. So I'm wondering if we really, is this part of the same process? That's what's going through my mind. Um, I think I'm raising the question earlier than I expected to, but I'm gonna have to raise it now. Is there really a generational divide? divide? Is it a divide or what is it? I, I would think, go ahead. Go ahead, Ann. Oh, well, go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to say to Adia's point, I think that um, her point about technology was really good because it kind of reminds us that everything, I don't want to say the same process is repeating itself, but I think the timing of the process is definitely changing. Everything is accelerating a lot more. Um, something that we were talking about earlier is like, we both are big fans of TikTok and a lot of people on TikTok are like 17, like uh, younger than us even. So, and they are on there with like this unharnessed, for lack of a better word, like honestly rage, you know, like they are very, very fired up and ready to do what they have to. And I think that comes from us growing up with like, you know, like phones on our fingertips. Like we see the news, it, like exactly when it happens. I remember like you know, like when things happen, it's like three minutes ago, this just happened and you know about it immediately instead of like having to go back to the TV, what, however you guys used to do it, but somehow news immediately. <laughs> and so, so somehow <laughs> this, this conversation, every time I engage you young folk and you guys are young folk, I come, I learn something. I, I learn something, reaffirm some things, but some things I learn. But mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm listening to you guys at 22 and I'm looking at these guys at 28 and I'm saying, you guys are old. Right. <laughs> right. Right. But the question is, is that a bad thing? Is not experience, you've heard the term, the best teacher? Mm. Uh, is that no matter where you are in life? I... Yeah. Let Anthony jump in there and then we're coming right back to you, son. Okay. Well, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And my, my favorite word with this whole topic is not so much generational divide, but situational awareness. I feel like mm. no matter what generation we are in, it's about um, you realizing and understanding what your role and what your responsibility as a human being, what is it that you're supposed to be contributing into the society or to the next generation. I think if um, everybody is more aware of what their situation is and what they're supposed to be doing, that can help out a whole lot. Because if you just look at, you know, it's not really divided, it's just situations. The baby boomers, you know, baby boomers grew up in a post-war economy. So it was a thriving economy. You know, people were having jobs that could sustain their family um, and still their real hard working culture in that generation. Um, and then you go to the next generation, generation X, it's more higher divorce rates start to become more of a normal thing. Drugs start to come into the neighborhoods a lot more. Um, and that was the first time where <clears throat> people started to have some type of distrust towards institutions, you know, um, organizations, the government systems, more and more just because of the things that happened, you know, honestly through the 60s and the 70s. I'm a hist historian, if you can't tell yet, but. Yeah, I'm um, listening to you. And I think that, and those were our parents. So when you get to the millennials, you know, I like listening to them because I was telling someone the other day, Adia and somehow I like listening to them because I was telling someone the other day, like she said, they were born into technology. Our generation, we actually got the best of both worlds. When we were growing up in middle school, um, even in the beginning of high school, we didn't have smartphones, um, Twitter, Instagram, different things like that. You know, we didn't have I remember when I went to go visit my college, I had to print out the directions on MapQuest, but I didn't have GPS on my phone. Um, so, you know, it's just situational awareness. And I wrote a piece of my newspaper and I let somehow go. It was called Black Roles and Responsibility. And the whole point of that is just understand if you an OG, you know, you need to reach out and engage to the younger generation. Even if they give you pushback, like a young generation person would saying, I don't need your help. I believe it's your responsibility. If you see someone has the potential to, you know, bite your tongue a little bit, take a little bit of that pushback so you can try to help mold that person. And then on our end, it's our job to be able to recognize one of the best terms I came up with two years ago to help me now is when to just, you know, shut up. I had a problem of just talking too much. And I learned that if I can just shut my mouth sometimes and actually listen to what the other 
a person has to say, even though when they say you're already in your mind, think that you already know, if you just listen to them, then you might be able to get something out of that takes you further. So I think more so than a generational divide is just situational awareness. I love that word. Those words, situational awareness. I'm going to start using that. Thank you. I learned something else somehow. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of continue my point from before. Um, I think like what I'm seeing a lot is emotional fatigue. Um, and that emotional fatigue from seeing the news gets younger and younger and younger, just because I think that like, you know, we're being overwhelmed with the news all day, like scrolling on Twitter, as much as you want to be there for recreational purposes, you can't avoid what's going on. Like you're still going to see posts about what's going on in the world. So I feel like that emotional fatigue is hitting us younger and younger. I've seen it with my younger siblings. Um, like I said, my sister is like 17 and she's already like, like so upset and so angry. And she like talks to me about this stuff. Like I wasn't even at that point when I was 17 necessarily. Um, so I think kind of to Anthony's point, this whole issue of what we're supposed to do or, you know, things like that. I think that uh, not to speak for the entire generation, but what I've seen is like people, people just trying to break out of what people are telling them that they're supposed to do just because they feel like it's not working. Like it's just one thing to see all this news all the time and not be able to do anything about it. Um, I just feel like I see so much compassion in Gen Z or like the, or what we call ourselves, yeah, Gen Z. But I think that that's something that is hitting harder and harder as, you know, as we keep going and that's something that's unavoidable. So to tell us this is what we're supposed to do or like this is your situation right now just kind of leaves people, you know, they, they feel like they can't do anything and makes them feel useless almost. And so um, I like to believe at least that I can do something. So, you know, because if I can't do anything about my situation or like the situation of the people around me, what, what else is there to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I, when I say um, what you're supposed to do, I really mean more morally, because I'm one of those, you know, if somebody tells me what I'm supposed to do, you can guarantee I'm about to do the exact opposite of what you just told me to do. That's me to the T. I don't like to be told what to do. I like to be guided on what to do. But I mean, as far as morally and situationally, and I said this point when we talked on the last show, um, when we do during the march and the protest downtown, we were down feeding protesters. Um, and it was a young girl who was about 12 years old who walked up to me. She had a YouTube channel, a big following. And then she asked me a few questions. And the last question she asked me was, what would you, um, what kind of advice would you give to the younger generation like me um, as far as what we need to be doing right now? And um, that was a shocker for me because up to that point, you know, in my mind, I'm always thinking we're the millennials, we're the youngest generation, you know, so why do I need to set an example for somebody? I am that new force, like you saying, I'm the one that's supposed to do that. But in that moment, I realized, you know, there is a younger generation and they're, they're gonna have their own feelings and thoughts about you. They might already have their own feelings and thoughts about you. So it made me aware of my situation and realize that even though I am that young millennial, you know, it's, I can start taking the time out to having conversations with people that's younger than me, learning from people that's younger than me, um, working with people that's younger than me to get the best product. I'm one of those believers that the right true answer is always somewhere in the middle. It's never left or right. Nothing's absolute. Um, it's always in the middle. Okay, we're gonna let DeLorean jump in on it. And after that, we're gonna have Alan uh, give us one of the questions that's come from either WLOU radio or through our chat uh, function, uh, DeLorean. Okay. And, uh, you know, I just want to add a little bit, you know, to, to Anthony and Sumhall's point, you know, Anthony's talking about how we, we came in um, it, with, you know, the mix of the two generations, right? We weren't born necessarily into technology, uh, but we have the, we've been able to see the benefit of the technology as well. So when, when, when we basically, what I feel like the millennials is, and this is this is part of our conversation that we had uh, offline, Senator Neal. Uh, I feel like we're a repeat of Generation X, and I feel like the generation behind us is determined to not be a three-peat of Generation X. 
the generation, you know, like you stated, or, or you know, you think that the general feeling might have been, in, in, at least in our community, general feeling might have been that, you know, through the, the triumphs of the, the movements that were the liberation movements that were going on in the 60s and the 70s, the general feeling from the adults at the time was that we had made it. So for the kids that they had, you know, they weren't structuring things to bring these individuals up to speed up to the top they you know they were affording them luxuries that you know you would see uh, maybe a, a a really wealthy family do right but everybody was affording these luxuries and so now the generation above us they don't have they never really got the the pull up and bringing up into you know, and, and the mentorship, and now we're trying to gain it. And I think that that's why we got, you know, now you see with Adia and somehow they're, 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 I mean, they're hardcore with it, right? So they're, they're ready to bust down <laughs> these doors and kick them down. And it's because we've seen generation after generation after generation, now getting onto their generation, where these asking and doing all these other things has failed. So now they really want it. So I think that, you know, you made a really good point about the 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 general feeling of individuals from the baby boomers when they went through those liberating uh, 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 liberating movements. So one thing we never really got into, we saw the the kind of differences that we have just in the in between Adia, myself, Sumhall, and and Anthony, and that's you know, I guess if we think about it, it's kind of the same thing as seniors looking down on freshmen. Like seniors not gonna look like, like freshmen. Oh my goodness, what are you doing? So you know, we see the differences there, but Senator Neil, what are you seeing around individuals in your age group? You know, and what is their general perception of the divide? I tell you what, why don't you hold that question, Alan? Why don't you take one of the questions from uh, this come in and, and uh, ask that, and uh, I'll I'll go from there. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, yeah. As a millennial, as millennials, do you feel that you're experiencing life that is different compared to those that's older than you? And if so, uh, how do you feel it's different? I would say it's, uh, in my experience, it's completely different. You know, me and my wife, we always joke about, you know, those those household rules our parents used to have for us growing up. Like, hey, you better not speak when not spoken to, or, you know, um, you, you'll get hit for this, you get hit for that. You know, there's it was a no tolerance, you know, zone for a lot of families, um, a lot of parents of my generation. So one thing that we try to do is, almost try to do the exact opposite for our kids. You know, we try not to be so on certain things um, that we don't seem as deem as that important, you know, that the older generation before us has. So I think from that aspect in itself, um, that changes your complete way that you grow up. You know, I know the Gen X, Generation X, their parents were the baby boomers. You know, I'm that was a cutthroat time. You know, t things were a lot more segregated and quote unquote serious back then in the 60s um, and parent and the family, the household was more concerned about working and providing for the family. Generation X started really focusing more on themselves and, the, and their families. And um, now gener our generation of millennials, we're the type parents, I don't think we've seen a generation of parents like we've had ever. You know, it's, now it's more acceptable for doctors to be ta have tattoos, ear piercing, ear gauges. I remember when we was in school, they used to say, you can't, don't get a tattoo, you won't find a job. Now everybody has tattoos, it's the norm. You can be a judge with a tattoo. So as far as how we are growing up, I do think it's a, a complete difference, just like it is in every generation. Oh, Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I on that question. Yeah, can I yeah. tap in there? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think, I just want to go from a financial perspective, okay? Things are totally different. They're totally different. And that's because, you know, it was a couple hundred bucks, you know, 700 bucks maybe for a semester or a couple thousand bucks for maybe a semester in school. And with us, you know, we're coming in with tens of thousands of dollars for a semester. But the issue with the inflation on the goods and the things that we, we, we like to, you know, afford ourselves is that pay hasn't met inflation. It has not matched inflation year over year. So everything that we, you know, do costs more. 
and in retrospect to what we're earning. So, hmm. okay, okay. Uh, it, uh, another Anybody question. Want to jump in? Wait, anybody else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I was just gonna give a quick tidbit. Um, that I think yes, there it's different. I was gonna speak that I think Generation Z specifically, and even some millennials, I think morally we're different. Um, I think our generation has gotten a new mindset about how the world works. Like we talk about things about like when we raise our children, talking about not gendering children or talking about things that are like asking for consent with children. So not ma like making sure that our children don't feel obligated to hug people when they walk in a room. Or they don't feel obligated to, you know, do certain things in spaces. So I think that specifically when it comes to, and it made me think of Anthony's point about how we were raised, the way that our generation talks about parenting, I think we're breaking down just a lot of divides and like morally we see the world a bit different. Uh, so okay. do you feel that the other generations were wrong or you just feel that it's different or it's just an evolution? I don't think it was, I don't think it's wrong at all. I think it's just evolution. I think generations before did their best with the knowledge and information that they, they had. And I think as more knowledge and information begins to surface and we learn the world better, we learn people better. Like, you know, right now we're learning more about the queer communities and we're learning more about the effects of like parenting on childhood and the effects of like black parenting and the trauma that that brings and we're learning from it and we're saying okay so what can we do differently so i don't think it was wrong at all i just think that time like that times are different we have more information and more knowledge now and we've seen the effect of the ways of older generations and so now we're just looking to change it okay delorean you had a question we're gonna we'll come back to questions later on but you had a question of me you want to re rephrase that or so I can yeah i I was just curious, you know, what you've seen in reference to what maybe, uh, you know, some of your your friends or your your circle, you know, of individuals around your age and the generation, what have you seen they think about millennials and the younger generation and, and maybe their role? Well, you know, it's, it's easy to generalize, okay? But there, there, there is a perspective there. It's, <laughs> there's multiple perspectives, quite frankly. And uh, so when I say these things, I say them advisedly because it doesn't reflect everyone. So I, I always have to start up with that. But let me, uh, there's, there's something that runs through it. One, there's three things that I, I hear uh, a lot. One is that the um, generation, the millennials, and some even beyond that are disrespectful of the older generation, They're disrespectful and dismissive. And um, you got to understand that these are folks that have lived life, and uh, you know, with life comes a certain level. We just dealt with you know the experience of the best teacher type concept. Some people don't get it though, even though they may be, you know, in their nineties. But my point is, is that. I hear that a lot. I hear individuals indicating that uh, some millennials, and I'm generalizing, there's always a danger in generalizing. Um, I hear individuals say uh, they don't complete what they're doing. They're out there, they start something, but they don't complete it. So that's one. Then another thing I hear is that they don't seem to want to listen so you have that type of piece that's out there. In fact, someone sent a question in, um, I think it was WLU Radio that raised a question of what is it that um, you think that older generation will have to do to, so you'll know that they're listening, for instance, from that standpoint, for instance, because I think it works both ways. Um, but those are the kinds of things. And then there are others, <coughs> excuse me, there are people in my generation that feel like uh, if you're over a certain age, you got to get out of the way. You know, they, they, they come up with the same thing. Get out of the way, you know. Uh, my, my, my retort there is that if you're still contributing, you contribute. You know, that's the decision you have to make. So the question in my mind is, how do you bridge that so-called gap? You know, I... I I hate to use the word gap and divide going forward in this discussion. We're going to do it just for the purpose of discussion. But the real question here, because what I'm hearing is value expressed from Adia in terms of what she can gain and 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 somehow at 22 is what they can gain. It's just that we're going to do it our way. We're going to pick and choose what we can use and we're going to move on with it. 
you know, respect that. <laughs> and then I see from those of the 28, you had a little experience. Well, you know, I've been knocked around a little bit. I understand what you're talking about now. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my stuff. But I'll tell you what, won't you share more information with me? Or I'm seeking to get more information from you because I know you've been there, done that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if divide is the right question is maybe we're not, we don't have the right relationships. Maybe we don't have, what'd you call it? Situational awareness. I like that term, situational awareness. So let me go back just a little bit. How do we, how do we bridge that uh, communication? How can adults show your generation that we are listening, but sometimes you seem unteachable? See, that's a pushback, right? How do oh, we I do it? it? How do we convey it? I just heard someone say, you need to come with it, older generation. <laughs> yeah, I got I got something for that. Um, you know, we don't want to be, okay, it's, it's a, yes, we see value in the older generation helping us, but we don't want to be experienced to death, right? They want to give, oh, this is a great experience and this is that, okay, well, after 15 different individuals telling us, okay, we've gotten nowhere, which is why we got you, we're in different jobs and because it's like, okay, where's the actual results? We like the mentorship, but we want to see some results, okay? You know, it's- Yeah, but don't you have to make the results? We do have to make the results, but you it gotta also make your has- way, don't you? Yeah, we gotta be a little give, gotta, gotta get out the way a little bit so well, we can come no in and make gives. some results. There's no gifts. You know, a lot of people in my generation, you, you made a good point, Anthony, earlier. Uh, a lot of folks in my generation um, uh, could get jobs. There's a manufacturing economy. It's now shifted to a service economy. And you could, you could go down and, and find a place at a, 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 a tobacco factory or, or uh, I, just all kinds of jobs were there. I mean, I never had a problem getting a job as, as a young man. But it seems a little different now because of the shift in the economy and so forth. And I, I wonder how you make your way because then it just seemed like it was there for us to make. Do, do y'all feel there's uncertainty or an undue amount of uncertainty and it's difficult to make your way? Or, or do you just see it's out there for me? I'm gonna go and get this. I think it's a little bit of both. It's definitely uncertainty, but I think that comes with just youth. It, to our generation. It's uncertain it's, that you feel like you're gonna be able to get a career like your parents and grandparents, like you seen, they don't work 50 years here, got the retirement fund, they look like they doing good. And for us, for some reason, it's like, it just don't seem like that's about to happen the same way. So we like, okay, we gotta figure out something different. And to DeLorean's point, I think the right word to um, add on to what he said is support. You know, we don't want any handouts or gifts, but you know, if you're a baby boomer, and you see somebody doing something that you got some expertise in or you've done before, you know, step up and support that person, whether it's monetarily to that organization or uh, mentoring that young person that you see. You know, if, since you had the experience to sit back since you were young at one time and you were, you know, stop telling me what to do at one point in your age, then you should be able to have the patience to, uh, you know, no offense, but you should be able to have the patience to take some of that pushback from the younger generations and be that mentor for them. I know you weren't talking about me. I'm 39 years old. I celebrate it every year. Right. <laughs> That's not an issue. <laughs> Speak on, young man. Now, look, let me, let me, let me I, I hear what you're saying, but doesn't that work both ways? Yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's let's say, is it uh, the older generations obligated to come up and knock on your door and say, look, young man, follow me or listen to me? I mean, does that really work? Or does it work the other way? You come up and knock on my door and say, hey, look, I mean, I've had experiences like that. In fact, I've had both of those experiences, you know, mm -hmm. reaching out for young people, trying to share whatever I could. And mm -hmm. I've had young people call me out of the blue, you know, and I mentor a score of individuals. And guess what? I know a lot of folks my age, younger and older, that mentor a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. I see, see, I'm wondering, I, I got to get back to this piece that you said. I'm going to work with that one, Anthony. Situational awareness. Come on, somehow. I saw you chuckling over there. Yeah. Um, 
No, I think that there's definitely a, some room, especially like some examples that I've seen recently where older generations have learned um, from us. Coming from um, my parents, there's a current, like Ethiopia is on the brink of a civil war right now. And um, I remember I spent all summer hearing my parents talking about how they don't necessarily agree with protesting or looting, like that was a very prominent thing that I heard from some older generation um, people from the Ethiopian community, how they didn't think that it was the best way to get the word out. Um, however, with the beginning of this, um, I've seen a lot of protests in Louisville and around the country organized by these older generation Ethiopian people who have learned from the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer and everything, and then borrowing those techniques in advocating for their own beliefs, which I think is really interesting because I feel like, you know, I think that like in some ways they are learning from us and it's out of necessity for their own causes. Um, and like I said before, I think uh, Gen Z millennials, I think that we're like a very compassionate generation who, you know, when we were all out on the streets protesting a couple of weeks ago for the humanitarian crisis over there, um, we had Black Lives Matter protesters joining our group and helping us and telling us this is what we found this summer to be the best strategies and the best techniques when you're out here on the streets. And that kind of support and organization, I feel like I've seen mainly from the younger generations. They don't necessarily, like, as soon as they learn what's going on, they're on it. They're promoting on social media, they're joining you in the streets, everything like that. It's just a little bit more of the reluctance. Um, and obviously, it was out of opportunity, out of necessity that, you know, my parents and my aunts and uncles took to the streets recently, but it's something that they can definitely learn more about. It's a very different, like I said, culture in America for protesting, but it's also very different for them being a little bit older. So I think well, there's again, let me welcome you to AAI and our subject matter is the generational divide. I like to refer to it as the so-called generational divide. And uh, I want to encourage you to share this uh, uh, to your contacts and your friends on Facebook and so forth, because we want to make sure that this discussion goes uh, really wide. And I want to point out also that this is uh, one of our presentations with these experts uh, on uh, the millennial perspective. Uh, but we're going to be doing this periodically uh, as an ongoing piece from different angles. So we want you to tune in. We want you to keep doing that. So I have as our guests, we have, uh, let's see, we have Adia Young. We have uh, Anthony Gaines over here. And then we have uh, Samha um, Araya. And we have DeLorean Malone. And we've been in a lively discussion for the past hour. And we have about a half hour left. And we're going to go deeper into this. I got to ask you this question. Let's talk about the protests briefly. What is your relationship? In fact, don't give me your relationship to protests. Tell me what is your perspective on the protests that's going on right now? I'm going to start with uh, DeLorean on this. What's your perspective? What do you see going on right now? Well, I see a lot of different things with the protests. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that initially, you know, I, I saw was that, you know, there was a lot of energy, a lot of steam, and then it, the energy, you know, kind of dwindled down a little bit um, in recent weeks. Um, and so that's, that's kind of one of the things that I've seen. But another thing that I've seen is just in, in this, this city, I've seen the protest been able to start these conversations, these conversations that would have never been able to have been had without the action of the protesters, such as, you know, even with Mayor Fisher's executive order. I mean, that would have that would have never came, in my opinion, without the protest movement. So I think that, you know, I've seen a lot of different You're things. You're talking about happen. the one declaring racism. Uh, as a public a, health a issue. Healthy right. Yeah. right. We, we never even, I mean, as far as I've known, we've never even declared it as existing let alone being an actual <laughs> public health issue so that's 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 huge that's taking some accountability and i feel like that was a result of of the protest what do you say uh adia um i think the point that stuck out to me most is i guess the i don't know i think it depends because i don't know 
to me, I don't know that the opinion on protesting is necessarily a, a generational thing. Because I think even within our generation, there are like three tiers of viewing this. Um, I think the idea is very between like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna call it radical because I don't like the, that word, but like between like rather extreme and then what I would call is like complacent beliefs. Um, so like, for example, one thing that stuck out to me is like the mayor's order. For some people, they celebrated that. They're like, oh my gosh, that's so good. It's a pub, like, public health crisis. But to me, I'm like, so what does that even mean? Like you declared a public health crisis. Thank you. I, that, that, doesn't help. that doesn't do anything. Like, literally, it's not doing anything except giving you a sticker and a pat on your back and saying, look, I'm acknowledging that you guys are doing something and going through something. Thank you for acknowledging years of toil and pain. Like, thanks, I guess. Um, so I don't know. I think for me, it's not necessarily a generational divide, but I think for us, I think specifically we're protesting, we have differences within our generation about how to get the changes we want. Some people are like, okay, you know what? Let's protest and go to the streets every day. Some people are like, burn it down, dismantle the whole system. Some people are like, um, you know, let's change these things via laws and policies, or let's go and, you know, send some letters in. Um, so I think there are levels to it, you know, and there are like def different degrees on how to view it. I think that I can definitely see, I think I, I know people with different degrees and different variations of opinions, um, and I can understand them all. But I think for me, this conversation is not necessarily a generational one, but more of a like, how far do we want to go? You know, how far do we need to go to see the results we want to see? Well, uh, somehow I'm gonna come back to you. You, you just, I'm, but I gotta hear what Anthony's got to say here. What what is right. it, Anthony, about this protest? What do you see? How do you interpret it? What do you what do you think is going on? I love you know every bit of the protest. You know from the protest to the riots to the the mayor's executive order. I love everything. It might got something to do with me just being a fan of history. Social study was my favorite class, but I'm one of those people that, you know, it's important for everybody to have done what they did in this moment. I'm glad to, to be able to be alive and be a part of this. And uh, to Adia's point, what the generation comes into play is now it's our chance since we got this movement like they did in the 60s or riots and protests in the 80s and 90s. Now it's our chance to be able to show people what we're going to do with this opportunity. So, you know, the protesters are down there stirring up, stirring up the message, putting the eyes on the problems. The rioters are, you know, keeping everybody on edge, you know, because you can't just sweep it under the rug when you know that people are going to are out here destroying property or doing whatever, causing chaos, expressing their anger and um, distrust in the system. And what that allows for is people like, some hall, Adia, us, Adia, I mean, um, political organizers, people that want to have a nonprofit organization. It's your opportunity now to go take advantage of that. My mentor, my OG calls it, uh, some people are tree shakers. That's what the protesters were down there doing. They were shaking the trees um, for organizers and other business and social entrepreneurs to pick those fruits up and do something with it. And that's where the generational difference comes. Like, what are we gonna do different with this opportunity with Mayor Fisher announcing that executive order? So who am I about to go after saying, you know, hey, the mayor just said this. So if you wanna, if, if your organization institution wants to make that stance that you are supporting the cause, then you'll help us to put this program up, to be able to get this going on. You know, and that's the way we gotta move. It's all about strategy. I'm a fan of, organized chaos. I'm an athlete. I was an athlete all the way up through college. So I like the uh, competitive nature of everybody going at it, blurting out your ideas, um, disagreeing, agreeing, you know, letting it all out. And then I, cause I think somewhere in the middle of all that, that's where we can find the true answer to everything that's going on. If we just keep wanting our side and what we doing to be right, then we're never going to be able to figure out how we can move forward. But if we can agree to disagree if we can always if people can argue without taking things personal and actually get to understand why somebody's protesting why somebody's doing this um i think our our generation has the opportunity now to show that we can do that and we're going to actually get some different results by doing it like that somehow this protest no matter how you see it i think you alluded to it, to it earlier has an international flavor. There, there are things because of technology uh, in part, uh, things were going on and sparked protests 
uh, on George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in London, for instance. But now I'm hearing even in your home, your native country, uh, your parents' native country, that um, it even affected that as well. I'll, I'll be interested in your expanding on your perspective on protests in today's societies. Yeah, um, I think that definitely the opportunity for protest is a lot bigger here because we don't necessarily have the same issues as back in Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, oftentimes, like I said earlier, the internet can be cut off at any time. The press is like heavily monitored. So they don't necessarily have the same option of like taking to the streets when some injustice happens. But I've found that within the past couple of weeks, um, a lot of people have taken to the streets in Louisville and DC and Columbus, Minnesota, like everywhere. I've seen all over the states, people have taken up this like, what I feel like I've seen it to be a very uniquely like black American protest culture. And they've learned from the people around them how to organize and what to do. Um, so people have been organizing letter writing campaigns all the way up to protests in the streets. So I definitely think that the protests that we've been doing this summer and like even before that has definitely inspired other people who would never think to do that, um, to use those methods to, you know, get out their word because not a lot of people know what's happening in Ethiopia right now. And as we were marching in the streets, people asked us and people joined us, you know, as they saw fit and as they were able to, which is something that I think is very, very different because not a, like, like I said, not a lot of people know about what's happening there but they would have never known about it. And so the fact that we're able to just have people join us off the streets is, is a huge success, definitely. But um, I did wanna to say to Anthony's point, I thought it was really interesting how he brought up what we do after the protests and the opportunity it gives to organizers to create organizations and you know social entrepreneurship. Um, but I, I really think that that's something that a lot of people overlook. And I think like I can kind of see a generational divide in there because um, a lot of people do the protest, they go home and then they're done. They say, I've done my part. I, I saw that a lot when I was campaigning for the Biden campaign in North Carolina. A lot of people would volunteer one time and say, he's gonna win, I don't have to do anything else. So, um, which is just not the case. So I think persistence is something that um, I'm seeing that varies among the generations. Like I feel like I've seen people like in their twenties, like us just fully fledged and full into it, like ready to commit everything to it, which is what I see to be such an admirable trait of like the younger generations right now. Like despite school, despite what's going on right now, they're just ready to give it all for the cause. And well, I think I'm too, sorry, go ahead. The initial, no, sorry, to the initial point about generation and dividing, reaching back, I think specifically we're protesting is definitely a time where we look to older generations and call on our elders and look at those before us because I think, I mean, this is new to us, obviously. Like, I mean, just like everything is new to us, like job hunting in the world is new to us, but specifically for this and speaking to Delorean's point about how protests have begun to die down. Well, the one reason for that is it's cold and the weather is like, doesn't permit the, you know, ease. Also with the results of the Brown and Taylor case, it was disappointing. Like people are taken aback and people are tired. Um, and then thirdly, too, after you get tired of being pepper sprayed and hit with rubber bullets, like after so long, you're kind of like, OK, this was a lot. I need a minute. Um, and so I think in times like that is when we look to our elders, the older generation to say, OK, they were shooting you guys down with hoses. What did you do? How did you get back up the next day? Because we can't figure it out. Like at this point, and I think, too, like from older generations, it's like, oh, no, you keep getting back up and you fight. And we're like, they hit us with rubber bullets. How about we come out there with something to hit them with something, too? It's like, well, we don't want to keep getting back up and dusting ourselves off. We're mad. And I like, you know, so I think that specifically with generational divides and protesting, I think this is a time, a unique time for us to look to elders and older generations to just really learn um, resilience specifically, like learning resilience in a time like this. Wow. Well, let me, let me, I got to ask this question. I must, I must go, I got, I got to take this somewhere. We have, we have uh, about 15 minutes left. And there's so much to talk about, and we're not going to be able to get to all of it. But uh, you brilliantly expressed yourselves here. I think this is wonderful. But we talk about protests. Let me make an observation. I'm going to ask a question on the tail end of that. 
and I'm going to start off with uh, Anthony, and you all just roll through it, okay? So protests, I'm, I'm hearing it from all of you. There's, 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 positive, there's a positive results have come from protests, the current protests. Um, but I've also sensed in what you're saying is, you know, protest alone is not enough that if you're gonna sustain something, you have to take the next step. So that raises the question of politics because policy drain, drives everything. What I do as a state senator is I engage in the process of developing policy. And again, I say policy drives everything. Uh, so what do young folks see about not just protests, uh, not just carrying on your business in life, but actually engaging the system, so to speak, the political system in this instance. I, I know uh, uh, some house already engaged or has been engaged in that process. She has her ob observation. So uh, I'll probably end up with you somehow on this, but the rest of you, what I'd like to know is what are your peers saying about engagement? Do they see the value in voting, for instance? or even registering to vote. Do they see the value in, in those individuals that they don't have, they don't, uh, you know, they got gray hair running around telling them these are the rules that you're gonna live by. Do they feel that they have a stake in engaging that process to make changes or to uh, put their ideas on the table? Give us a sense, Anthony. Um, let's go to Delorean, then over to Adia, and then somehow as quickly as we possibly can so we can get to a few more questions. Got you. And I agree. I definitely think that our generation is talking to most of my peers that people do. A lot of people in our generation don't believe in the political system, voting. Um, a lot of people in our generation don't believe that our votes matter. The politicians, all of them in there are doing anything at our best interest. And, you know, I'm a opposer of that. I'm in the middle. I believe it's not working the way we need to. But I do believe that if we work the system right, we can get the results that we're looking for is why I started my podcast, the Smoke Break Podcast, which I invited you on last year. And the yeah. whole point of that podcast is to um, have, be a hip modern podcast, but relaying the information of how important it is to vote, relaying the information, how important it is to um, be worried about this issue that's being talked about or this bill that's getting voted into law. I think there is major there needs to be major efforts in changing our generation's outlook on what the political system can be. Because I look at it, when you look at the protests, the legislators, I have a visual of like a chessboard. You know, it's different levels that needs to work. You know, protesting in itself is multifaceted. It can't just be the marching in the streets. So the marching in the streets to me is, you know, that's the front line, that's the pawns. And then, you know, behind that, you got the different rooks and um, different pieces, the organizers, the business and social entrepreneurs that can pick those pieces up. And then our king and queens in the middle are people like you, Senator, the ones that are in the positions to make noise in Frankfurt, um, to write up bills and legislations that can actually direct, uh, directly affect change. But just like a game of chess, it all has to work. You have to have the strategy. And I think that's what our problem is right now. We have to figure out especially in our culture, the black community, what is our strategy from the streets all the way to the legislators? How can we work on the same page to actually get what we want to get done? I think that's so important what you just said. I'm going to use that chess analogy myself. A 13 move chess player is going to always beat a four move chess player. And when you use the word strategy, strategy is key to that. You got to work through that whole process. DeLorean. Yeah, and I, I agree with you, Anthony, a lot um, on a lot of those points. I say, you know, I can tell you the from the inside out and the outside in too. So like pre-2018, I was one of the individuals we'd, we'd all sit down and we'd have conversations and we would talk about how, and you know, uh, politics, schmolitics, right? Oh, we're going to vote for this person and they're not going to care about our interests. Things aren't going to change no matter what we do. And then, you know, uh, somebody I grew up with, you know, their mother was running in, in a political race. I was like, oh, huh, you're running? What are you running for? And she told me she was running for a circuit court judge. And I was like, well, you need any help? 
And she was like, well, yeah, actually I do. So, you know, and through that, through that process, I was able to start, you know, we went, we went door knocking, we went, you know, to people's individual houses, we were putting signs out. And we, I saw the perceptions of individuals that were the same as mine prior to working in the election. But see, now when we were able to beat the incumbent who had some, you know, some some stuff going on with his you know prior in, in the news and whatnot we we're able to beat that incumbent then i could see the value of what what we were doing when you're voting in your in your for your people in your state when you're voting for those judges because those are individuals that you're going to see you're going to see those individuals if you get into trouble so you want to have you know individuals you know that represent you in the courtroom so you know, it is very important for us to, to vote and, and to get out and get engaged. Now, when I talk about the, pro, the protest fizzling down a little bit, it's because like what Anthony said, you know, that's, that's not a sustainable, you know, it's not sustainable. You know, I, I'm, I'm a parent, right? You, you got kids, Senator Neal and Anthony, you know, you got kids. So that yelling and screaming, that works for so long, right? It only works for so long. And, and we know at a period of time, you're going to tire yourself out. You ain't, we just got to wait it out because you're going to scream and yell and tire yourself out because no one can scream and yell that long. Nobody can do it. So what we need to do is just like how when we were growing up in the school and we were, we were reading about Brown versus Board, we're reading about all those things that were put in place in policy. That's just the, that seems to be the general progression of what the, the movement is. So the movement is you got those tree shakers down there. They're shaking the tree like Anthony said, and they're shaking the tree so the individuals, you know, that have the power to do different things, they can, they can do that now. They've got the leverage. That's a perfect segue over to Adia. Adia, go to your heart on this one. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. Again, I think that this varies with people's degree of extremity or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's interesting because even within the past year, my perspective on these things have changed. I study political science. I very much, and I still like have a desire to, in a sense, be in the political realm. I want to do policy work. Um, I have dreams of, you know, becoming a Congress person, a Congresswoman and things like that. And I still very much, in a sense, do believe in politics, but there's also a very strong part of me that has recently learned about the, the issue with that. And I think, um, I don't know, for me, it's, not even trying to visualize it's no longer like it's the vision or the ideal state is no longer seeing black people in congress or seeing black judges it is changing the system in general because no matter how many black judges we get or how many black congressmen or how many black politicians we get the entire political system within itself was never built with the thought of black people in mind it was never built to benefit us and it no matter how many ways you want to flip it it'll never be for us and when it was created, was there a black person in the room? No. What were black people doing at that time? Like, wh where were we at? What state were we in? Um, and so I think like, it's just interesting too, because again, my perspective on this has changed very recently um, because I studied politics and I still, to, to an extent, I still love politics and still want to get involved. I vote now only because that is the system we have in place. Like I'm going to participate in the current political system because in my opinion, not participating just doesn't like serves no benefit. There's no benefit to me resisting. Well, I mean, there is, but there's no benefit, immediate benefit to me not voting because my vote can still help to make things a little bit better. But I think the ideal state is different. Like the ideal state isn't getting black politicians into positions or like allowing us a seat at the table. It's reevaluating the entire table and the structure of the table, you know? And it's reevaluating what these things look like. And so, I don't know, I think that's my biggest point. I think just vision wise, the visions are different. Like the vision is no longer to have black people in positions of power is to evaluate what does power look like? Who said like, what is power? Who is determining what the structure looks like? And it's not even about putting us there. It's about reevaluating the entire, the entire structure. So I, I sense a little ambivalence in you. It makes me think that you're still evolving in this Absolutely. process. And yeah. we all are, we all are. I mean, a, a bold experience can change your perspective on anything. In a given in which moment. Has, yeah, absolutely. But the fact is, the fact of the matter, and what I see is growth in this whole process. I have to make that comment. So, so we're going to go to uh, somehow and see her perspective. What is? What do you think? Is, you you've been involved in 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 formally in campaigns as well, like Delorean has been. Um, 
are you encouraged? Discouraged? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I honestly, I agree with Adia's point a lot. I think what pulled me into the campaign this year, like everybody, I could not stand to see obviously Trump get another term just because of the way, you know, obviously he was threatening everybody, but also like when I think about my family, you know, my parents are refugees. My dad is a small business owner. My mom has a lot of issues with her health. So, you know, like healthcare is a very important issue in our house. My younger sister is in public school, you know, like there's so many different reasons that I bring myself out to vote every single time, because I understand that there is like, um, a, you know, like something very important about voting from all the way to the federal level to the local level. However, I think that like Adia said, I cannot be complacent with just like seeing black and brown faces in these positions just because I, I think that what I'm understanding it to be is that there is less and less, less and less happening, I guess, if that makes sense, because I feel like as we witnessed the protests this past summer, as we're seeing everything, we're realizing how slow everything is and like all the bureaucracy behind everything. Um, and I just feel like going back to what we were talking about earlier, that, you know, it's just like not enough for us to just like wait around and have all this be done. The fact that we were protesting in the streets for months and months before we even got a decision on the Breonna Taylor case, which was in the end super disappointing, was awful, you know? Like there's like, it's so frustrating that we have these people that we've elected and it seems like, you know, everything's moving at a snail's pace there, which, I think personally, like like you said, I'm still evolving with my beliefs and everything, but I think that there's definitely room to change the system in a way that better reflects who we are and what we want to see. Just because I think putting in like certain faces, just because they come from the same community as you, does not mean that they can override the bureaucracy that Absolutely, currently exists. Yeah. There's definitely a system that, like Adia said, I can't, I can't say better myself, the system was not built for us. And we need to do something to acknowledge that. So, so I have I have some a real quick question. You got to give me real quick answers because we come to a close in terms of our time. First of all, and th this is uh, I guess a, a bicameral type. Well, there are two parts to this. One is, are you hopeful? And do you see value in the generations developing a relationship to benefit? from each other's experience, energy, vision, and skills. You can either say that yes or no, and if you want to qualify it, do it, but do it in 20 seconds each. Okay, I'll go really quick. To the question, yes, I do think that there's a benefit in generations merging and having conversations and bridging those gaps. I absolutely think there's a benefit there. Am I hopeful? It varies every day. Some days I am, some days I'm not, if I'm being honest, it varies. Um, yeah, since our mic is on, I'll go. Um, yeah, I think in the end, I am very hopeful because like I said, what I've seen, I've seen people change their minds, especially like older people, like just talking and realizing the merit of what us younger generations are doing. So I think it varies from day to day, but obviously I feel like I'm very hopeful because I am seeing some sort of change. Very quickly, Anthony. Yeah, I'm extremely hopeful. I'm extremely hopeful just because I'm a believer in you know, I, I like this country, America. I think that if we can actually reset the system, we don't need to change it completely. I'm like the idea of putting in more black faces, giving people like Adia and somehow an opportunity to be in those positions. I'm extremely hopeful for that. And as far as the generational thing, I think it's the most beautiful thing that can happen is us to work together. My business, I'm 28, my other partner's 40 something and my other partner's 60 something. And we're able to get a whole lot of work done just by able to throw things off of each other combat find the right thing. Lauren, very quick. I'm very hopeful. I think that, you know, there's a lot that we can get done. And I do think there's a lot of value. I mean, I've seen it myself, you know, I'm even, you know, connecting with, you know, individuals that are older and older generation, I'm seeing the results. And I do think that there's a lot of value that we can get from, you know, the older generation, because if they're the ones who are in charge, right, then they're going to know how to defeat that structure. They're going to know how to work with that structure. So I think we can we can learn a lot from the older generation. 
Well, we're going to continue this uh, uh, discussion uh, with a mix of other individuals, and we're going to invite uh, individuals here back into different uh, mix as well. I want to thank uh, our guests tonight for giving us that expert opinion. It was a tremendous exchange, uh, tremendous insight, and I'm proud of, of each and every one of you. And I look forward to continuing this discussion and having other people engage with you. Uh, those who are on Facebook and you have friends that are on YouTube, uh, tell them this is going to be posted uh, later on tonight or tomorrow on YouTube as well. I want to encourage you to share this. This is about conversation. It's about exchange of ideas. We want to keep this thing rolling. Uh, but this is a very critical question. We're going to revisit it again. I want to thank uh, our, our technical director, uh, Brunhilda Carrington, as well as Alan Benson, who's our uh, coordinator and facilitator, as well as uh, Ron Jones, who is uh, our uh, liaison with WLOU Radio and the rest of our team uh, uh, that puts this piece together. I'm just a figurehead here. So we want you to stay with us, look for us, uh, grow with us, share that information, share that information. And from the African-American Initiative, thank you so very much and good evening.